Blog Talk Radio. Good evening. Welcome to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickle. My name's Tom Press, and I'm guest hosting tonight. I'm the regular show host of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio, heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And I'm con- here to continue our study on uh, a series entitled The Jesuits' Diabolical Foundations of the New World Order. And last time we concluded with the reading of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel. And we're going to briefly review that tonight to see how the Jesuits have have twisted the meaning of these scriptures and deceived the entire Protestant world, and by that deception has overthrown Protestantism by exonerating the papacy from the onus of Antichrist. Remember, the Protestant Reformation was built on the knowledge the, the unanimous cons, uh, consent of the Protestant reformers was that the Pope, the papacy, was and is and always will be the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Scriptures. In order for the Jesuits to defeat the Protestant Reformation, they had to change the mind of Protestants on that count and shed the onus of Antichrist onto someone else in the distant future. Now, this is how they did it. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, God, through the angel Gabriel, gives Daniel a prophecy. It says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right. Seventy weeks, a 490-year period. Now, we're going to see as we continue in this prophecy that, that, that this 70-week period of time is divided into three parts. The first part of the prophecy, it concerns seven weeks of time, or 49 years. The second division uh, is broken down into 72, or excuse me, 62 weeks, or 434 years, making a total of 69 weeks, or 483 years. Remember, the prophecy is for 70 weeks, so there's one week remaining. That is the ministry of Messiah. One week from his baptism until the stoning of Stephen. That, remember, the prophecy is concerning Jerusalem and the Jews. So this prophecy isn't concluded until the nation of Israel formally rejects Jesus as their Messiah. That is what took place at the time of the stoning of Stephen. Stephen had convinced the Sanhedrin that they had wickedly slain their own Messiah, and rather than to get on their knees and confess their sin and accept Christ as their propitiation, their lamb, and enter the kingdom of heaven, they stoned Stephen and shut him up. Jesus was baptized by John, anointed the most holy by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. Three and a half years later, Christ gave up his own life. The veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, thus ending the animal sacrifices and the oblations. Temple Mount worship was officially closed by God. And then three and a half years later, finishing the 70th and final week of this prophecy, Stephen was stoned. Now, let's continue. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, this prophecy is all about the Messiah. It's not about Antichrist. Antichrist is not even alluded to anywhere in this prophecy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, shall be seven weeks, that's the first division, 49 years, then three score and two weeks, 483 years, and, 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 and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the first two divisions will be up until the coming of Messiah. 
Now, if you add seven weeks and 62 weeks, you get 69 weeks. Okay? And verse 26 says, and after the three score and two weeks, or in, or in other words, after the second division, seven being the first, 62 being the second, all told 69 weeks, it says, after the three and score two weeks, which literally means after the 69th week, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's in reference to Prince Titus, who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. This is a, a, a parenthetical phrase added by, by the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, in this prophecy, showing us what is going to happen to the city and the people. Okay? But the subject is the Messiah. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And now the parenthetical insertion, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, back to the Messiah. And he... Messiah shall confirm the covenant, and he did the covenant in his blood. All the prophecies of the of the Old Testament uh, uh, were were instructive as to what Messiah would do. That he would be crucified. He shall confirm that covenant with many for one week, one week, seven years, and in the midst of the week, in other words, after three and a half years from his baptism. He shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out upon the desolate. When Jesus said it is finished and gave up the ghost, God ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom, opening the Holy of Holies. There is no more sacrifice for sin, no more oblation for sin. Christ is our sacrifice. To sacrifice animals, goats, bread, as does the Roman Catholic Church or anyone else, they've simply rejected that one true Lamb of God, the all-sufficient sacrifice for mankind. Now, because the Jews rejected Jesus as their Lamb, they tried to continue making animal sacrifices. And it says in the second half of this verse, it says, and for the overspreading of abominations, that is, continued animal sacrifices, he, Messiah, shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. He shall make the temple desolate, even unto the consummation. That's because he's going to send Prince Titus to destroy it. Not one stone remained upon the other in 70 A.D. after the Romans destroyed the temple. And it says, it will remain deficit even unto the consummation. Now, others may disagree, but I believe this consummation is until Christ's second coming. The Spirit of God does not dwell in temples made with hands any longer, neither at the Vatican nor at some proposed rebuilt temple on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And it, and it ends with this, and that determined shall be poured out, uh, shall be poured upon the desolate. God has a determination for those who seek to continue sacrifices and oblations in rejecting Christ. He's going to make their temples desolate. In other words, he is no longer, he's not going to dwell in those temples. He's not going to honor their sacrifices and oblations. And he has a recompense for those and it has been those who continue to make these animal sacrifices, and it's already been determined, and it will be poured out upon those who are desolate in spirit. In other words, they are the temples of the living God, but the, but the Spirit of God does not dwell in them. In other words, they profess to be Christians, but Christ is not there. There is a special punishment determined for those who are empty vessels, those who say they are Jews and are not. Those who say they are Christians and are not. Now, 
We've been told in all of our churches that there's a seven week or a, the Daniel 70th week, a seven year period of time after the Jews have been restored to their land, after Israel has become a nation, after they build a temple mount, after they begin animal sacrifices, or when they're ready to start animal sacrifices, some Antichrist figure will come and make a covenant with the Jews, allowing them to begin animal sacrifices once again. And then in the midst of the term of that seven-year contract, allowing the Jews to commit abominations, he's going to renege on the treaty. That's what I was taught in my Baptist church. That's what I believed for 50 years of my life. And then God opened my eyes to the true identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. It is not Antichrist in the future. It is Christ. 2,000 years ago, he perfectly and completely fulfilled that, that prophecy. 2,000 years ago, the vision is sealed up, and so is the prophecy. And anybody who tries to take the seal off of that prophecy and open up that book again and try to manufacture a refulfillment of any portion of this prophecy has offended God. And the Protestants, the so-called Protestants, I call them ecumenical evangelibellies, have united with the Roman Catholic Church, and they believe this Jesuit lie called futurism that puts Antichrist off into the distant future and exonerates the papacy as being the Antichrist of Scripture. Remember, there's a strategy behind all this. The Protestant Reformation was literally fueled with the idea that the Pope is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy. That is true. But if they could make all of Protestantism believe that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven-year period of time, in this so-called phony futurist 70th week of Daniel then the papacy is exonerated. And that makes the Protestant Reformation a grievous assault upon the papacy, one for which reparations are due. And that's what the ecumenical movement is really all about. But just remember, all of this futurism, all of this lie, was created by the Jesuits simply by changing the identity of the he spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. If you believe that that he spoken of is some future antichrist, you are deceived, just as I was for 50 years of my life. But if you believe that that he is spoken of is the Messiah, which this prophecy is, con is all about, then you have hope in Christ and you will not be deceived. There is no seven-year future great tribulation. There's going to be tribulation for God's people in every generation. And history makes this more clear than I can even express to you in the short period of time that I have tonight. But now, to put a period on this, I'm going to show you the mechanics through which the Jesuits Change the identity of the he in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, from Christ to Antichrist to deceive the whole world. This little booklet is relatively new to my understanding and possession. It's entitled The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and Its Entry into Protestant Christianity. It is written and compiled by H.C. Martin of 33 Elizabeth Street, Parks, New South Wales, 2870. It's the third edition, and it was printed in 1973. <clears throat> Remember, we started this series discussing the Jesuit oath. And now we're going to show you a little Jesuit history to prove that they are true to their oath, that they're very... A reason for existence is to destroy the Protestant Reformation and everything that arose as a result of the Protestant Reformation. This is how they did it. And this is literally the foundation of the New World Order. 
if people ever come to the realization, once again, there have only been about three or four generations who have even ever heard of the term futurism. Christians prior to this Jesuit deception called dispensational futurism were historicists. They saw in the papacy the Antichrist. They understood the true meaning of Daniel ch or Revelation chapter 17, describing the Roman Catholic Church and the states or the nations over which she ruled. They were absolutely correct. And history leaves no room for doubt about this. So the whole world was liberated by the Protestant Reformation simply by the knowledge that the Pope was not a man of God. He was the man of sin, the son of perdition. And so all the Roman Catholic, the, the Protestant reformers who had been previously Roman Catholics came out of the Roman Catholic Church. They led as many as would follow out of the Roman Catholic Church, and they overthrew the entire papal system. No, mon no more monarchical rule. They had no need for a monarch. They had no, no, no more need for a king. Jesus was their king. And they had no, no, no more need for monarchical tyranny and oppressive laws because the Roman Catholic Church was no longer the Church of Jesus Christ in their mind, and the king over, over which uh, the papacy ruled, that ruled the people, he was no longer a legitimate king, and neither were his laws legitimate. They had a king, and they had a law, a divine law, and it was written upon their hearts. So they liberated all of Europe, especially the Roman Catholic part of Europe, who followed their example. Now, how did the Jesuits come up with this futurist lie that has deceived the whole Protestant world and just virtually destroyed the Protestant Reformation? This is key information. Again, this little booklet is titled The Origin of Dispensational Futurism and Its Entry into Protestant Christianity. The author says, Today, many Protestants have departed from the Christian interpretation of the prophecies in the book of Revelation and many other passages in the Word of God. Church history has not left us in ignorance concerning the dispensational interpretation of the book of Revelation. Every Protestant should know and spread the following startling facts. Scholarly Dean Henry Alford, 1870, informs us that the futurist school of prophecy can be traced to Jesuit Ribera of 1590 A.D. Now remember, this is about 60 years after the Protestant Reformation, 70 years after the Protestant Reformation. His name was Jesuit, a Jesuit priest by the name of Francisco Ribera. It was invented for evil purposes. For example, quote, to protect the papacy and to confuse the Protestants as to the true meaning of the revelation. This scheme is not to be commended for obvious reasons, unquote. All right, first of all, the objective of futurism is to protect the papacy. And how does it protect the papacy? Because it sheds the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and puts it on some unknown singular fig figure in the so-called 70th week of Daniel at the end of time, either seven years or three and a half years before Christ's literal return. So... Futurism has confused the Protestants about the true meaning of the book of Revelation. Now, what's he speaking of? Dan or Revelation chapter 17, which clearly describes the Roman Catholic Church and the, and the governments over which it rules. In other words, the, 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 the global uh, uh, state as it existed during the old world order, during the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church ruled supreme. The papacy ruled supreme in Europe. The papacy seated and unseated the kings of the earth at his pleasure. The papacy believes and teaches that the, that the pope is the vicar or the replacement of Christ on the earth. The vicar of Christ, that's what his title is. It literally means antichrist. If you look up the word vicar... 
and the word anti, the prefix anti, A-N-T-I, they have virtually the same meaning. So if you were to walk up to the Pope of Rome, and instead of acknowledging him as vicar of Christ and called him Antichrist, he wouldn't frown at you. He would stick out his hand and shake your hand for acknowledging who he is. Antichrist literally means the replacement of Christ. Now, that is exactly what the Protestant Reformers believed that he was the Antichrist of the Bible. And that woman that rides the scarlet-colored beast of Revelation chapter 17, simply a description of the Roman Catholic Church and the states over which she ruled that enforced Roman Catholic canon law upon the people. It was a church-state system. First of all, you have to remember that the Vatican is a church and a state. It's the smallest nation in the world. It's an independent, sovereign nation of 108 acres. And literally, it is, it is called in the Bible, that city, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And it did during the old world order, during the medieval ages. And that is what the Jesuits are hoping to restore in the new world order. Now he says, scholarly Dean Henry Alford of 1870 informs us that the futurist school of property, prophecy, that which sends the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy and puts it on some unknown singular figure personality at the end of time, seven years before Christ's return, can be traced to the Jesuits and particularly Francisco Ribera of 1590. It was invented for the evil purposes of, quote, to protect the papacy and to confuse the Protestants as to the true meaning of the revelation. This scheme is not to be commended for obvious reasons. Why? Because it deceives the whole world. It has undone the Protestant Reformation. It has destroyed the Protestant Reformation. I've asked those who profess themselves to be Protestant, I've asked them, what makes you a Protestant? They can't tell me. Well, what does the word Protestant refer to? They can't tell me. Protestants got their names because they not only not only preached Jesus and him crucified, but they protested his counterfeit in the world, the papacy. That's why they are called Protestants. They protested the papacy arrogating to himself the place of God on earth. Now, we all worship Jesus as best we know how, but there's almost none of us anymore that protest the papacy, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of the Scriptures. Why? Because the Jesuits have shed the onus of Antichrist to a future figure seven years before Christ returns. It's called dispensational futurism. It is the greatest lie since the Garden of Eden. Now, the book continues. It says, The great reformers opened up Revelation chapter 17 and 18 to all of Europe and showed the people the great whore and the scarlet women of the disaster and the, uh, with disastrous results to the papacy. Okay, This is what led to the Protestant Reformation. They understood Revelation 17 and 18 referred directly to the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church state, and they rebelled. They, they, they protested, and this had disastrous results for the papacy because the Protestants, the Protestant Reformation spread like wildfire. It liberated all of Europe. Nobody bowed their knee to the Pope anymore as a general rule. And also the kings that that, that the Pope put over them, the tyrants, they overthrew them, and they replaced, they replaced those tyrants with their own selected kings. The people picked their leaders, and they wrote their own constitutions and laws. Even Roman Catholic countries did this. Those nations that continued to regard the papacy as, um, as the head of the Roman Catholic Church, they would no longer tolerate his temporal power. They would no longer have him to be king over them. So they followed the example of the Protestant reformers, at least in that respect. 
Now he continues, he says, in the book of Revelation, God foretold, exposed, and denounced the works and doctrine of the great apostate church system, which would rise out of and succeed the wreckage of the pagan Roman Empire. Thus, apostate system, or excuse me, this apostate system was papal Rome. Okay? The Vatican, the papacy, and the kings over which the Pope ruled. It, it, was a, it was a continental system. It was called the Old World Order. Now, our history books don't talk about it much anymore. But even, and I'm exposing my age here, but in my, in my life early in the schools, they talked about the old Roman Empire. Little was, little was referred to the Roman Catholic Church, but certainly I had some concept of what the old world order was, what, what was about. Now I have a much better understanding, having seen what the Protestant Reformation did to that old world order. It literally destroyed it. And for all intents and purposes, it was dead. The papal power was rejected by most of Europe. And the United States was founded on Protestant principles, that the people are the power in the country, and that there's a separation of church and state. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that which is God's. So they separated church and state in response to Christ's teaching. That is a Protestant idea, and the Vatican literally hates it, and will not rest until church and state are once again united, when the woman is seated once again upon the scarlet-colored beast, as was in the old world order. He said the Roman world had been ruled by paganism. Now, this is before the Holy Roman Empire, before the creation of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It says the Roman world had been ruled by paganism until the 4th or 5th century A.D., but now a change was destined to come to pass. This newfound power, this newfound power, being clearly symbolized in the book of Revelation as a religious power by saying that it would be seen sitting in the temple of God. That is to say, in the church itself, slaying the lives of men and nations and ruling with great power from a self-appointed pinnacle which it had set up. See Second Thessalonians chapter 2. This papal power was to emerge after the Roman Empire was removed and would continue until it would be, quote, consumed by the spirit of his mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 8. And I have another scripture that indicates this. Paul, in speaking to these Thessalonians, said, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. Now, Paul was writing in a letter that he feared would fall into Roman hands, so he spoke cryptically. But he also reminded them in the scripture, you, don't you remember when I was with you, I told you these things? And Paul is simply saying that I spoke specifically about this restrainer, and we know who was ruling at the time of Paul's ministry to the, to the Thessalonians. It was the pagan Roman Empire. And when the, when the pagan Roman Caesar left Rome and moved to Byzantium, or Istanbul, Turkey, as it is known today, later known as Constantinople, Caesar Constantine left Rome and went to Byzantium or Constantinople. Whoever would stand up in, that, in his absence, in that power vacuum that he created when he moved to Constantinople, then would arise the man of sin, the son of perdition. And who was that? History leaves no other option than the papacy. The papacy is what stood up in the place vacated by Caesar. Again, Jesus said, Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and render unto God that which is God's. Now, Paul that Caesar would leave, uh, would leave Rome 
And whoever stood up in his place would be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition. And the Thessalonians knew precisely who he was talking about, though it had never been seen in the world before. The Apostle Paul was led by the Spirit of Almighty God, and these Thessalonians knew what was about to happen in the world, even though it would not occur for another three or four centuries. And this was preached among the Christians to watch out, watch Rome, and watch what happens when the Caesar leaves Rome, and whoever stands up in his place in that power vacuum left behind by him, that would be the one who would persecute the saints, the man of sin and the son of perdition. It is the Vatican. It is the papacy. Now, the book continues. It says, as the the darkness of the Middle Ages thereafter began to be lightened by the hard-won labors of the Protestant Reformation, all the reformers, without exception, listen to that again, all of the Protestant reformers, without exception, believed and taught that papal Rome fulfilled exactly every detail foretold in the Bible concerning this new religious edifice and was therefore this apostate and antichrist power which, which while purporting to be the only true church of Jesus Christ <clears throat> was actually fighting against him. Now how did the Protestant reformers knew this, know this? Because God revealed it to them from the scriptures. And it was already believed by the true Christians existing in the world at that time and subject to the, both the pagan Roman Empire and what replaced it, the so-called Holy Roman Empire under the papacy. Now, when this devastating exposure became revealed from the scriptures themselves, the first reaction of papal Rome, the papacy, was to try to destroy the Bible. It was the Bible that told the Protestant reformers who the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist was. You see, they never knew this before because the Bible was only in the possession of the Roman Catholic priests. It was written in Latin, the Latin of the doctors, a a, a dead language that the people could not speak. And so, literally, the only form of the gospel that they got was what they received from their priests in the Roman Catholic Church. And obviously, if any Roman Catholic priest came to the knowledge that the papacy was the Antichrist, and the Roman Catholic Church for which he served was indeed that scarlet harlot of Revelation chapter 17, he kept his mouth shut because the job paid too much. He had too many benefits. And besides that, he'd have been excommunicated from that church and probably would have been burned at the stake. So they never told the people who the Antichrist was. And the people went on believing that God had left his throne and power and glory on the earth in the very seat that the popes occupied. And so they continued to obey the papacy as though he were the voice of Christ on the earth. But when the Bible was finally translated into the language of the common people so that they could read it for themselves, they came to the unanimous conclusion that the scriptures, particularly Revelation chapter 17 and 18, describe none else but the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church, and they came out of that church as if the seat of their pants were on fire. They knew the judgment that would eventually fall upon the papacy and upon the Roman Catholic Church, and they got out while the getting was good. And they formed what is now known today as the Protestant, the Protestant Reformation. Now, it says, when this devastating exposure became revealed from the scriptures themselves, the first reaction of papal Rome was to try to destroy the Bible. They thus gathered all the early English Bibles they could lay their hands on and had public burnings of them. One of these ceremonies, excuse me, One of these ceremonies, I've lost my place here. It says, one of these ceremonies was conducted by 
Bishop Tunstill in A.D. 1530 at Paul's Cross, London, when William Tyndale's English translation of the New Testament was burnt publicly. However, when this endeavor eventually proved fruitless, in other words, burning Bibles became fruitless because the Protestants were printing them so fast, Rome couldn't burn them fast enough. The Protestant reformers knew that the Word of God would liberate all of God's people out from under the authority of, of the Antichrist. So you can imagine the, 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 the efforts that they went to to print these Bibles and distribute them all, all, all over Europe as far and wide as they possibly could. Rome simply could not burn them fast enough. And it says, it says they burnt them publicly. However, when this endeavor eventually proved fruitless, they began to massacre and burn at the stake the living witnesses of the truth, two of the most notable of whom were bishops Ridley and Latimer, who were burned alive at Oxford in 1555 A.D. during Catholic Mary's reign. Bloody Mary. We've all heard of Bloody Mary, and nobody remembers who she was. She was a Roman Catholic, devoted to the Pope, and her aim was to restore England to the temporal authority of the papacy. And in order to do that, she had to destroy the Bible. And failing that, she had to destroy the Protestant reformers, and she had to destroy anybody that read and preached that Bible. Bloody Mary killed by burning at the stake Latimer and Ridley, Ridley, the two testimonies of England, to the truth that the papacy is, was, and always will be the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. They lost their lives. They were martyrs for Jesus Christ. They were martyrs for the truth. They were protestant martyrs, and they tried as best they could to liberate and make sure England never, ever returned to the control of the papacy, and that yet they're hardly remembered by Protestants today. As a matter of fact, how could they? Because most who profess themselves to be Protestants don't even know what it is to be Protestant. And it is this. Yes, you may say you worship Jesus Christ, but you must protest Antichrist. You must help try to liberate the rest of the world with the truth of who Antichrist is. Now, when it was seen that both these drastic measures failed them, burning Bibles and burning those who read it, the incoming tide of truth and of the kingdom of God on earth, and the, o the, the only procedure remaining to the papal church was to endeavor to misinterpret all such verses of Scripture which foretold and condemned its system, the Roman system, making the condemnation contained in these verses appear to fall on some other party instead of themselves. This endeavor, however, produced two opposing schools of thought, even within their own ranks. One of these schools is known as the Preterists. Okay, I will mention it. I won't discuss it too, too, for, too much because it is not the predominant view today. But the, pre the, the, the Protestants, or excuse me, the Preterists, believe that all the prophecies in the Revelation were fulfilled prior to 70 A.D. So that Antichrist has already been destroyed, and that now it is up to the Christian world, the quote-unquote Christian world, to conquer the rest of the world for Christ's return. And literally, Christ cannot, in their minds, Christ cannot return until the whole world is converted to Christianity. That is the preterist belief, that Antichrist was in the long distant past prior to the rise of the, the papacy. And that literally, the papacy is the to them, the very seat of Christ on the earth, and that they must do whatever the papacy says to do to conquer the rest of the world, to make them Catholic or to make them quote-unquote Christian, when it's not Christianity at all. 
Now, not many people anymore believe in preterism. So now we'll talk about the focus of this book, the futurists. They are the majority, the vast majority of professing Christians today are futurists. And they've never even heard the word historicists, which all generations of Christians prior to ours were historicists. They saw in history the Antichrist. They saw in the here and now the Antichrist. And they saw in the future the Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. But these futurists, they're not historicists. To them, the papacy has been exonerated. The Protestant reformer was the promise. Re, the Protestant reformers were wrong, and that now the Antichrist is some unknown figure that won't arrive on the world scene until seven years or three and a half years before Christ's return. And they're really kind of indifferent about the papacy, but nonetheless. They have the the in their belief that Antichrist hasn't arisen in the world yet and won't until seven years before Christ returns. They have to believe that the that the Protestant reformers were wrong, that the papacy was not Antichrist, was not the Antichrist of the Bible. And that laid the foundation for what we know today as the ecumenical movement, the unification of all the world's religions under one ecclesiastical head, one spiritual head, the priest of priests, okay, the Lord of Lords, the Pope of Rome. And the New World Order acknowledges now that the world acknowledges that the Pope is the Lord of Lords, and they want to make him the King of Kings, too. So that's what the New World Order is. It is built on the lie called futurism that that exonerates the papacy and sheds the onus of Antichrist away from him onto someone off in the distant future. That's how the Jesuits destroyed the Protestant Reformation. And few Protestants can even acknowledge that the Jesuits even damaged the Protestant Reformation because they don't know what the Protestant Reformation was about. It was about a protest to see the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And now, they don't being deceived about who Antichrist is, they don't want to liberate anybody from the papacy anymore. They want to restore the old world order. And they call it the new world order. Again, the name of this series is The Jesuits' Diabolical Foundations of the New World Order. The diabolical Jesuit foundations of the New World Order is futurism and ecumenism, the two biggest Christian buzzwords of today. And literally, the whole world is deceived. The whole Christian world is deceived. Now, we've just about run out of time. We've just begun our discussion about futurists. We'll return to this subject next Wednesday on the program. Again, my name's Tom Press, host of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Heard Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. And you're welcome to come and listen and return next time to Mystery Babylon News Radio with Walt Stickel for another edition of the Jesuits' Diabolical Foundations for the New World Order. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening.